Okay, uh, uh, welcome everybody um, to what's the the last um, seminar in our series of, of the Crash uh, Research Network on Subaltern and Decolonial Citizenships. Um, it's been a really, really interesting, diverse, um, fascinating um, series, I think, <laughs> as uh, as one of the co-conveners uh, together with my colleague Sarah Radcliffe. And um, we're delighted uh, uh, to end with um, uh, Jelke Burston, who is uh, a professor at uh, King's College London. Um, and uh, Jelke is, uh, well, she's published actually um, uh, on uh, multiple kind of topics associated really with gender and uh, development and also kind of transitional justice and, uh, um, uh, and violence. Um, specifically with a focus on Peru mostly, but also with some work on East Africa. So her book in 2010 was called uh, Intersecting Inequalities, Women and Social Policy in Peru. Um, and I'm just looking at the website and in 2014, she published uh, Sexual Violence During War and Peace, Gender, Power and Post-Conflict Justice in Peru. Both of those books have come out uh, in Spanish translation, which um, I want to uh, note and um, consider to be really important uh, uh, that she made that happen. Um, in uh, just uh, last month, uh, her latest uh, book has come out and that's called Gender, Transitional Justice and Memorial Arts, Global Perspectives on Commemoration and Mobilization, which has come out with uh, Routledge Transitional Justice Series and is co-edited with Helen Scanlon. So, um, as I said, Yelka has worked on uh, transformative gender justice in post-conflict uh, societies. Um, but today uh, she's going to be talking to us about one of the most uh, important contemporary issues um, in my view, which is um, abortion rights uh in uh, latin america so i will just hand over to yelka and um, invite you to talk thanks very much for coming to speak thank you so much sean and sarah and uh, everybody for for joining us on this very very sunny uh afternoon um <clears throat> so i'm really pleased with this particular invitation particularly because as you say sean um, it, it, abortion is a really really important um uh, issue, feminist issue, but not only that, there is a very concerning counter movement. There's there's a lot of pressure upon feminist campaigners and on policymakers to reverse any gains made in the area of reproductive health and rights. So um, I really appreciate this opportunity today to think through a set of ongoing political processes related to women's reproductive health and rights and this, this neoconservative counter movements. Um, and so this paper is part of a, a first step really uh, in, uh, in writing a co-authored uh, piece in first instance for a project that we're doing with the Latin American Bureau and a project called Women's Resistance to Violence, a project led by uh, Kathy McEwen and for which I'm working with Andrea Espinosa, who's also here now today to gather data regarding the, the politics of abortion. And we're trying to think through what does this mean in contemporary Latin America? So that's where we are with this, no? So today is really an exploration of how can we understand what's going on currently contemporary campaigns for and against abortion have become a battleground, I think, over sexual morality as a mode of governance. So that's going to be my main argument today, that abortion is a battleground over sexual morality as a mode of governance. Pro-abortion feminist activists define abortion as the right that will allow women to control their own body, fertility, ultimately sexual autonomy, while neoconservative alliances seek a re-envisioning of colonial patriarchal rule with abortion as one of its main legal pawns. Mm. So anti-abortion politics is about sexual morality, it's about heterosexuality, and it's about patriarchal governance. It's about modes of governance that seek to reestablish a, a tiered hierarchy of citizenship in which some have more bodily autonomy than others. Or it is also not only a, 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 um, 
uh, a reaffirmation of patriarchal governance, but also of colonial struggle uh, structures and hence uh, struggles. So to make this argument, I will first set out the problem, discuss the uh, legal activism of the last so many years. Then I will turn to the neoconservative counter movements and its significance, why it matters, what it means. And then I will turn to thinking about who affects this most. Uh, not everyone is equal in this story. Um, so we need to think about that and what does this mean for the governance of population through a prism of gender, sexuality, and indeed race and class. So my main geographical frame is Latin America. So that is what I will refer to. However, I think that what is happening in Latin America is, is, is relevant uh, far beyond. And there are similar trends elsewhere uh, ongoing. So it's also useful and necessary to think about how feminist and neoconservative battlegrounds travel across the world through global political trends and transnational movements and authorities, such as the Vatican, for example. Now, the starting point for returning to abortion politics was recently the approval by the Argentinian state on the 30th of December of 2020 of a bill that legalizes abortion in all circumstances after a very long battle that starts in, the 90, in Argentina in the 1980s. And as some of you who follow Latin America closely or who follow the politics of reproductive rights, um, this victory was indeed celebrated across the continent as a victory for women's rights and equality as the starting point to, to, to a turn uh, towards more progressive and feminist politics. However, unfortunately, after the dust settled, we can see that the turn to the right is still ongoing. Um, and even the populist left is often neoconservative in its sexual mores. We see that currently ongoing in, um, in the elections in, uh, in Peru as well. So various scholars have made the point, of course, of a lack of feminist solidarity among male-dominated left-wing uh, left movements since the 1980s, notably uh, Maxine Molyneux in her work. Now, first, a couple of basic numbers to get our head around the problem here. What is the problem of abortion? According to the Guttmacher Institute, one of the main authorities with regard to um, abortion, um, as of 2017, more than 24 million women of reproductive age in Latin America and the Caribbean have an unmet need for modern contraception. Yeah, so that is uh, 24 million. This also means that 24 million have difficulty controlling their fertility and hence their own sexual body. Uh, between 2010 and 2014, Latin America and the Caribbean had the highest rate of unintended pregnancy of any world region, 96 per thousand women. In the sub-region of the Caribbean, the rate was 116 unintended pregnancies per thousand women. An estimated 14 million unintended pregnancies occur each year in Latin America, and of these, nearly half end in abortion. So that's about 7 million abortions per year. And the majority or many of those will be in a context of Ill illegality, of criminal criminalization. Yeah. And I don't really have numbers of how many of those 7 million abortions end in physical harm to women. I haven't looked for them either. So if anybody knows that this, such numbers exist, uh, then I'd be keen to, to, to hear about it. Um, but we do have information on where the provision of abortion is legal and hence easier and safer to access than elsewhere. And of course, we know that there will be more unintended pregnancies and hence more abortions if there is a lack of access to um, reproductive health and rights more generally. No? So there is a link, of course, to between high levels of abortion and, um, and illegality or lack of access. So where is it? Uh, easier and less easy or illegal to uh, obtain an abortion. Um, in Latin America, the only place where uh, abortion is, is legal is uh, Cuba, Guyana, Puerto Rico, Uruguay, and now Argentina. Yeah? In other countries um, where abortion is 
prohibited altogether, uh, criminalized uh, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Haiti, Honduras, Nicaragua, Suriname. These countries have no explicit legal exception at all to abortion. Then there's a whole bunch of remaining countries, of course, in between, who will have some exceptions for what is called thero therapeutic abortion, mostly in cases of risk to a mother's life. Um, a very few countries have also decriminalized abortion in cases of rape. Only Brazil, Bolivia, Colombia, Chile, and, and some states within Mexico. So the majority is illegal, no? But even in those countries where there is an existence of, of this ba basic uh, uh, legal exception of therapeutic abortion, that does not mean that the service is actually accessible as there might be not be any drugs or infrastructure or professionals actually to ex execute the process. Uh, there is still extensive um, um, conscientious objection to abortion within uh, the medical health services. So it, it, it doesn't secure uh, women from prosecution either because of those reasons, which is something that we see in the, in the Peruvian context, for example. In countries like Peru, Venezuela, Paraguay, and Guatemala, abortion after rape is still prohibited and punished with prison, ranging from a couple of months to several years. It doesn't necessarily happen everywhere, but it's a, a, a threat. Uh, Peru even has a special consideration to what is called aborto sentimental, a sentimental abortion, which is an interruption of a pregnancy that is a product of rape out of wedlock. And only out of wedlock. Then um, in those cases, you get a lower sentence. So it's still not legal, but you, get, you might get a lower sentence than if it would be uh, a product of rape within wedlock. Uh, in Ecuador, until April uh, 2021, abortions in cases of rape were only permitted for women with a mental disability. So this sounds all very restrictive, no? Is there actually any progress? Well, there actually is. It's slow and arguably minor, but, the, but it's important because there, there tends to be a domino effect, no? which is why we were also excited about Argentina, no? For one and then another. And the last couple of years, some changes have been uh, made. Mexico City and Oaxaca fully legalized abortion uh, completely. Yeah. Um, Ecuador decriminalized abortion in cases of rape only this year. Colombia also decriminalized abortion in cases of rape. That is a, a law from 2011 and Chile uh, in 2017. So this is only decriminalization in cases of rape. Nevertheless, it's, that seems minor, but it is big because the idea is that lawmakers, feminist lawmakers are pushing every time a little bit more and, and sort of bit by bit um, a push for, for changes, you know? So they're very much the result of, of very consistent uh, strategic legal activism and feminist policy making uh, within, within governments and, uh, and um, uh, law lawmakers. So uh, feminist activism around abortion emerged in the 1980s, of course. Uh, and was not initially not very subtle. There is a change if you look at feminist activism uh, in relation to abortion that is that is very clear of, of, of if it's strategic, persuasive or more feminist activism, feminist activists. And this, these two images show the difference. Yeah. In, in the 1980s, the, 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 the image on the left is from Argentina. No a la maternidad, si al placer. Uh, no to motherhood, but uh, yes to uh, uh, pleasure. Um, and that was at that moment uh, a type of activism, perhaps similar to contemporary Ni Una Menos or Me Too, in the sense that it's very disobedient to social norms. No, it, it goes against the, the, the normative understanding of what gender is and what female sexuality is. Uh, in that particular context and time. It, it was a somewhat a riotous activism. It's what uh, 
um, um, uh, Sonia Alvarez calls uncivic activism, an activism that goes against uh, the social norms and perhaps even um, uh, the gender norms and, and, and even legal understandings <clears throat> of those of that moment. And I think actually, so Ni Una Menos Me Too is also uncivic, largely because it, it it's about um, mob justice, no? Because it's about online justice and no legal justice. And that in itself is very riotous, arguably. Now, contemporary campaigning, that is the image on the right, has, has learned not to make claims based on an idea of bodily autonomy and women's rights, because that seems too easily rejected with arguments around the right to life, which has been for a very long time the main sort of counter argument, you no, know, the right to life of fetuses. And instead, it points at authoritative uh, evidence that shows that comprehensive sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, protects against unwanted pregnancy, abortion, and maternal mortality, no? So abortion and pregnancy is then strategically framed as a health issue rather than a rights issue. And we will see later on that that is also problematic to a certain extent, of course. But it appears to be more uh, palatable perhaps than women's rights for it allows for stronger uh, uh, arguments against the pro-life um, lobby, if you wish. <clears throat> This does not mean, of course, that abortion as uh, an issue of women's rights is erased at all. It's just that different persuasive arguments are developed for different audiences. And one of the reasons of some of the recent successes at decriminalization in Ecuador, Colombia, Argentina, and even Chile is because of the alliance between women in politics, healthcare campaigners, and feminist collectives, each, each speaking to different constituencies, no? And one of the strongly related policy initiatives that is strongly related to abortion and, and receives, uh, if possible, an equal amount of resistance from the counter movement is comprehensive sex education, which is, as you can see on, on the image on the right, educación sexual para prevenir anticonceptivos para prevenir aborto legal para no morir, no? Uh, education so sexual para decidir. Uh, so sex education to decide, contraceptives to prevent and abortion uh, so as not to die. And uh, sex education is the ideal tool to reduce unwanted pregnancies and abortion, but also to create a more e equal and respectful um, society in terms of gender uh, and in intimate relations and a lot of the sort of the comprehensive sex education that has been developed by professionals over the last um, 15 years or so in Latin America are 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 very non-discriminatory they're very um, um, uh, uh, pro-sexual diversity and respect for and so on and that again creates a lot of resistance from the neoconservative counter movement so from Peru and Ecuador to Mexico, comprehensive sex education has been obstructed and has really generated a, a lot of protest from um, counter movements and even from religious parents groups um, who have successfully taken to the streets um, to protest um, sex education and influence conservative uh, politicians. In Peru, conservative resistance to new, new legislation has actually helped remove two education ministers and indirectly a president between, um, if I remember well, between 2011 and 2017 or so. So this is a very powerful lobby all about the national curriculum of sex education, never happened before, I think, in, in so much uh, resistance. And the arguments, and this is the, the organization, the image is, is from the Peruvian uh, uh, neoconservative counter movement called Comis Hijos No Te Metas. The arguments against sex education are directed at the, at the familiar idea that talking about sex creates perversions. In previous times, th these perversions might have been masturbation and sodomy. Today, the perversion is 
gender equality and sexual identity. You know? Unsettling the rigidity of the gender binary is the perversion. You know? And contemporary holistic sex and gender education is, 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 is trying to unsettle those binaries. You know? So that is what in, in part creates so much resistance. But it has also created an, an, an oppositional language against gender as an analytical category, as an idea. So hence the, the headline here, genero nunca mas, never again gender, no? As if gender itself is, is, is something that is evil, no? And I, it reminds me of the opposition to feminism and, and I, how, 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 um, um, how feminism as an, and feminists um, have been portrayed as 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 or stigmatized really in in uh, in a lot of cultural discourses, and uh, these neoconservative organizations are trying to do the same with the term and the terminology around gender. No, they're trying to make it a stigmatizing terminology, while feminists in Latin America very purposefully moved from feminist analysis to gender analysis because it was less stigmatized. No although it might not in practice not have meant anything different. So as we see here, uh, never again gender spearheaded or an organization by six men, no, which already indicates that this is about um, the, the idea that families headed by men should decide over the sexual mores of their families and their children, no? Um, and the, hence the con mis hijos no te metes, don't touch my children, which is a slightly ironic sort of play of words that I don't think that they meant as such. Um, but they they have this idea of sort of these are my children and hence they are not, they, 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 you know, this is a private space. So there's a link here, which I will draw on a little further, which to, to an, a neoliberal economy, really, a privatization uh, that is very effective. So opposition to sex education is a morality move that governs the sexual and reproductive lives of young people into very strict gender roles. And this neoconservative opposition further emphasizes that the opposition to abortion is not an argument about the start of life, which is what a lot of uh, what the pro-life movement and they want. Uh, uh, I remember a very powerful debate in uh, in this in Congress in uh, in Argentina around you know with a, a pro-lifer explaining um, uh, when life starts, and that's what's often the argument that is used in religious contexts. But that's not what it's about, because if that's what it's about, um, no, and not about women's lives, but about fetuses' lives, then the rational course of action would be good sex education, surely, and access to contraception, surely, for all young people. And instead, the opposition to abortion and sex education is really an argument about sexual morality as a tool for patriarchal control. Governance through sexual morality is in great part effective because of this privatization of patriarchal rule. The men saying, don't mess with my family, no? So the question is perhaps why does this neoconservative counter movement against women's rights and LGBTQ, and that makes the direct link, of course, huh? if it's about a gender binary, it's also very clearly an opposition to LGBTQ rights through this opposition against abortion and sex education. And why has it so much traction and why now, no? Now, um, I call this a, a, a counter movement. This is one, I'll stop sharing. Um, I'll, I call this a counter movement, first of all, because I feel that it's, uh, wait, are we still? Um, because I feel that it moves against the historical, albeit nonlinear, erosion of the entwinement of religion and the state on the one hand, and the steady move towards more gender equality, including an acceptance of 
sexual diversity. So it is against an historical development that seems to go another way towards more uh, gender diversity and sexual diversity. So the neocon movement is a backlash against gains made in terms of women's rights, gender equality and LGBTQ rights or gender and sexual diversity more generally. Of course, since the 1990s, there are laws and policies with regard to gender violence. A lot of Latin American countries have quotas for pol political parties or, or even for business. Um, uh, women are uh, full participant in, in higher education. Um, several countries have laws to protect LGBTQ persons against discrimination and even legalize same-sex marriage, Argentina, Brazil, Ecuador, and Colombia. So these are very real uh, gains over the last uh, 20 years or so, 25 years or so, that are now seeing um, this backlash. And I think uh, there are several things that are coming together, no? The why now? I mean, opposition to abortion has always been there. So it's not, in that sense, it's not new, but something is different in what is going on now. I think that, well, for one, we can, th there's a very poor cho choice of words in pronouncements by the Vatican about the dangers of gender ideology, no? So the whole idea of gender ideology is rooted in, um, in pronouncements by the Vaticans. Um, the idea that gender uh, uh, is a threat to a binary and heteronormative understanding of human sexuality as made by God, and thus a threat to the dominance of the patriarchal family. It was first coined, the term gender ideology, in 1998 by the Vatican, then reinforced by Ratzinger in 2004, and again by Pope Francis in 2016. So the Vatican keeps repeating it, you know. Um, so these pronunciations are really fuel on the fire of religious groups, um, in particular among growing evangelical churches, of course, and civil society organizations in the US and in Latin America who actively campaign against gender ideology. And one of the most visible of such protests, as some of you might be familiar with, was, was against Judith Butler, who was hackled at a Brazilian airport for propagating gender ideology. Um, protesters even burned an effigy of her. Now, I, I must say that this is also very much uncivic protest, of course. Sonia Alvarez with her uncivic protest, I'm not sure if she was actually referring to this kind of conservative protest, but it's interesting that that neoconservative protest is, 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 is really adopting forms of protests that we know from the other side, from the Progr more progressive sides, no? And, and it's effective, clearly. Um, so why now, no? Why, why is there now such, seems such political power in, uh, uh, in these um, neoconservative uh, standpoints? Well, for one, th there seems to be strong alliances between religious groups and political leaders. This is arguably a result of opportunity, as Lee Payne and Arushka de Souza Santos have argued with regard to Brazil. Opportunity being an ongoing economic and political crisis, which play in the hands of a growing visibility of and support for strict moral codes. Um, and that then has created political uh, space for political alliances that take the defense of the family in one breath with anti-corruption, for example, no? So it becomes about morality. There's also a very clear transnational element to these movements. Um, religious leaders have very strong networks throughout Latin America and indeed um, uh, in North America as well. Um, uh, according to Stephanie Rousseau, um, she looked at this in the Peruvian case and found that the Peruvian neoconservative religious movement and its leader, Christian Rosas, was actually educated at a Virginia-based Evangelical Liberty University. And th this leader, who is one of the most important leaders in the Peruvian um, 
neoconservative anti-abortion, anti-sex education movement. Uh, he maintains strong networks throughout Latin America. So he travels uh, th throughout uh, South America to give talk, talks, attend events, and so on. So as we know from social movement theory, of course, international alliances, as well as political opportunities, are very important elements in, in the success of social movements. Um, it seems possible that the conservatism of these movements also attracts funds from private sectors. I haven't looked into the financial aspects of this, but there is a clear economic factor involved in the sense that uh, the language and, and the, the interests that are involved uh, resemble the interests involved in a priv privatization of rights. No, mis hijos no te metas, don't touch my children, this is my family. And the confirmation of patriarchy fits a neoliberal understanding of the world in which rational man can legitimately exploit another's labor without interference of the state. And this economic exploitation is racialized, of course, but it's just as much gendered. Binary gender roles deliver much cheap reproductive labor and social care, so it fits. Um, so while I like to see this movement as a counter movement against the historical development that is ultimately progressive and emancipatory, the institutional and electoral power of this counter movement is very real, of course, as we know with the election of Bolsonaro in Brazil and Trump in the US, even if Trump is now voted out, that electorate remains, no? So what is at stake? Why is abortion the ultimate battleground for equality and emancipation? And why do we have to resist and, and, and fight back? Well, um, if women cannot control their fertility, they are forced into domestic spaces. This is part of the economic argument, no? They will have much less chance to participate in the labor market or in politics. They will be tending children if they uh, cannot control their own fertility. It turns women into reproductive machines and makes them the property of the household, of children and men, taking away economic independence and thus also increasing vulnerability to violence. A lack of control of fertility implies a lack of control over one's sexual body and that makes that sexual body vulnerable to abuse. This lead feeds into patterns, very clear patterns of gender-based violence. The same values that promote neoconservative sexual morality also condones and even facilitates gender-based violence. It condones gender-based violence, for example, by blaming women for rape, uh, including incest and sexual violence against minors more general. Um, there's a very harsh stance towards victims of rape in many, many countries in Latin America, where children are forced to carry babies to term against their will. And that is in itself, of course, a very clear form of violence. Now, the sexual morality that a pro-life stance implies subordinate, subordinates women in, in a patriarchal constellation of state and society and erases LGBTQ lives. It makes those lives impossible. And hence, it inv invites also violence against their bodies. No? So it increases, it tends to increase violence against LGBTQ uh, lives. And the sexual morality that is based on a heteropatriarchal family model with reproduction at its center denies and actively oppresses sexual and gender diversity, reducing gender to a male, female biological binary. So I think we need to see the battle for legal abortion as the current front line of gender equality for women's rights and sexual and gender diversity more broadly, because without access to contraceptives and legal abortion, women will never be released from domestic duties or in other words, without access to sexual and bodily autonomy, patriarchal roles are difficult to change. Um, so resistance to abortion and sex education is not to protect life, but to protect male privilege. And as Jean Grugel and Pia Rigerozzi argued very recently, reproductive rights is the starting point for women to be considered full citizens beyond motherhood and family, the condition to be being able to fully participate in the labor market and in social and political life. 
I briefly want to outline the current, what the current resistance to abortion is unleashing in Latin America. Yeah. And I'm sure that some of you have read about this in, uh, in more generally, uh, but it's important to highlight the, 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 the extent of the damage that is being done. Unwanted pregnancy and unsafe abortion is currently violently policed in El Salvador and Nicaragua. Women are imprisoned for aborting and some even for miscarrying. This is structural violence against women sponsored by the state. So in that sense, it's not privatization either. It's, it's state violence, no? And this violence policing is not the only structural violence against women's reproductive bodies. There are increasing reports, increasing research, which shows the, the extent of obstetric violence, no? The abusive treatment by medical staff of pregnant women before, during, and after childbirth. And there's a very particular class and racial element to this. Women treated badly are often racialized and impoverished women. State services, those are the women who go, who attend state services. And state services are often overloaded and staff is not well supported because of that, that privatization of, of health and education. So uh, it comes together again. Now, another uh, note to make, despite increased access to contraceptives throughout Latin America, bar abortion, there has been an improvement in access to modern birth control more broadly. But despite this, uh, adolescent pregnancy has hardly decreased. So fertility rates have dis decreased dramatically across the region, but adolescent fertility has not decreased, no? And this is in great part the result of unmet need, a lack of sex education, and so on. But also, it points to uh, high levels of sexual violence among young people, you know, and, and uh, high levels of abuse within families as well, which is completely unaddressed. And this matters, of course, it matters. Um, children and, uh, are uh, attended in the health, health sector. No, so part of this shift of, of sort of making uh, reproductive health and rights about health rather than rights, emphasizing the health factor rather than the rights factor, means that um, uh, adolescent mothers and everything around that is, is recorded as part um, of a health problem. Yeah, but a, a, a large part of these very young mothers are actually should be criminal cases. Yeah, if the age is cons of consent is 14 in many countries, then anyone who falls pregnant before 14 are cases of statutory rape. No, but they're never discussed as part of criminal offenses. They're not even noted, not even in the press as criminal offenses. And uh, we have looked at the pandemic numbers of adolescent pregnancies, which is really quite concerning. The pandemic has exacerbated this, of course. In 2020, 26 children in Peru, only in Peru, 26 children under the age of 10 were recorded to give birth in healthcare settings. Now, under the age of 10, imagine what needs to happen before a girl can actually give birth at that age, meaning that giving birth at that age is very rare but still it increased threefold in 2020 compared to all previous years, yeah? Um, abortion is refused to these children, so they have to live their lives with that emotional, physical, and actual burden of bearing a child conceived through rape. In Peru, again, girls between 11 and 14, so still under the age of consent, 1,155 pregnancies were registered by the healthcare system in 2020. Now, so this is about unintended pregnancy. That's how it's registered by the healthcare service, healthcare uh, service by the Ministry of Health. That's where we got the numbers from, yeah? Um, but that category unintended pregnancy completely blurs the line between health concerns and the recognition of sexual violence against minors, a cr criminal act, no? In Bolivia, same period, no, from January to July 2020, almost 20,000 cases of pregnancies in adolescents were registered, 90 pregnancies a day. In the case of girls under 15, 
uh, almost a thousand cases were registered in Bolivia, again, as unintended pregnancies and not as rape or incest. At the same time, the authorities, the, the Ministry of Health notes that the majority of those cases are actually the result of sexual violence within the family environment, but nothing is being done about that. So the issue of child sexual abuse as a criminal offense is simply not discussed. It discusses about the legality of abortion or not, you know, with, the, with these children uh, um, uh, carrying the burden. Are all women and girls affected equally by sexual and gender-based violence and uh, abortion politics? No, of course not. Because one of the reasons why legal abortion didn't take center stage in politics as soon as women entered politics in the 1970s in Latin America is because the higher educated middle, upper middle class women who enter politics actually have access to abortion and reproductive health care you know, in Latin America. Again, this is the difference between private and non-private uh, healthcare systems. You know? So where elite women have access to private healthcare, they also have access to abortion. If it's illegal or not, that doesn't really matter. Malartun uh, noted this in her book on Chile already very in the early 2000s and in her comparative work, which she did with Laura Weldon as well, that women with access to private healthcare do not have a problem generally in accessing reproductive health, including abortion. And so we must think about the politics of abortion and indeed the politics of sexual and reproductive health care, that it affects certain people much more than others. And hence that this restrictive patriarchal sexual morality is a mode of governance with particular consequences for the poor and indigenous populations of Latin America. And this brings me, if I still have time briefly to, um, do I still have time, Sean? I didn't really, yeah? Okay. Um, to briefly, I want to raise briefly the case of forced sterilizations in Peru because it's, it's, it's contradictory. And at the same time, it, 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 it confirms my argument, I believe. In the mid 1990s, I, after major progressive movements in the world, after the Cairo Conference on Population in 1994, the Beijing Conference on Women in 1995, the Peruvian government under Fujimori implemented a population program with funds from USAID, USAID uh, which saw 300,000 women and some men sterilized under often unhygienic and coercive circumstances. The system ran on quotas demanded from local healthcare workers to sterilize the local population, in particularly in poor and rural areas. So it was, and, and I've seen the paperwork for ministers, government ministers, who, who literally defined the program as, a, as, a, as a, a, a policy to reduce poverty. Yeah, that is what it was. It wasn't about reproductive health or rights. It was a program to reduce poverty by reducing the poor population. So the program was halted after much protest and withdrawal or funding and so on. But the repeated attempts to actually judicializing the case by prosecuting its architects have failed up till now. And currently this sun Sunday, there are uh, elections in Peru and the Peruvian uh, uh, front runner, Keiko Fujimori, again claims that there was nothing wrong with the program. It was bringing family planning to the poor, you know? Now, this is an extreme case. We must believe that it was an extreme case and that, that it is not, you know, that it's an outlier. But it points at the way in which women's bodies are variably used for the purpose of governance, poverty reduction, reinforcement of patriarchy. And the episode of forced sterilizations of the poor has not generated equal protest from the neoconservative anti-abortion and anti-sex education movement. And that is interesting because th that's what it should do, no? If this is about the protection of life, then surely, uh, and sexual morality, then surely this should generate um, 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 uh, large protest movements from the neoconservative anti-abortion movement, but it doesn't. So these two moral opposites, a politics of mass sterilization versus an anti-abortion pro-life politics, seems to be walking very peacefully hand in hand to produce a patriarchal colonial mode of governance through a politics of perversely oppressive sexual morality in which indigenous women are either scolded for, ha for having children like guinea pigs 
which is the phrasing that were used in these programs for not being able to control their own fertility. And they're also denied the tools that would allow them to do so effectively. Hmm? The information, the healthcare, and so on. So how can we understand this? Well, Wendy Brown uh, argued that this neoconservative sexual morality already before this new neocon movement, this was written in her, uh, in her uh, work in the early to mid 2000s, that this neoconservative sexual morality must be seen as a mode of governance and citizenship. And following this line of argument, neoconservative anti-genderism in Latin America is very clearly a deliberate politics of oppression and exclusion using formal politics and legislative intervention via anti-abortion and anti-sex education politics. And considering the racism and classism of these neoconservative politics, its explicit exclusivity, we need to consider this a form of governance as a deliberate reinforcement of a colonial hierarchy through patriarchal body politics. But if this is so, if this is indeed, uh, if, this, if there is sort of a colonial hierarchy in this, why would mestizo families, rural families, working class families buy into this and vote for such a politics of oppression? And I believe that it's exactly why governing through sexual morality is so powerful, because the control over bodies and sexuality sells as a policy of neoliberal privacy. Con mis hijos no te metes, no? Meaning my family is my fiefdom for me to rule. So by making the most intimate of human relationship the center of power, the neocons also seem to empower the powerless or at least its patriarchs. Body politics, or rather a strict intolerant heterosexual morality directed at reproduction is a highly effective way of governance through societal hierarchies. And as we know of colonial sexual regimes, such moralities also reproduce racial hierarchies and understandings of racial hierarchies. Arguably then this form of governance through sexual morality draws the marginalized into a subaltern citizenship that reproduces gender and racial inequality from the most intimate into the most public. So now we know what the anti-abortion lobby wants and how it mobilizes sexual morality for the racialized patriarchal governance of populations. And I call them neocons, I continue to call them counter movements because that gives me a spark of hope that actually history is going into another way. But at the same time, we need to ask, of course, are they the counter movements or are the feminists progressive? Are we the counter movement? No. Who are then the uncivic activists in this story? The, the feminists demanding an expansion of rights uh, and or defending the gains that were made or the variety of religious lunatics and established religious organizations and the opportunistic populists that come in between. I don't know, of course, history will tell us. Um, as a last note, I just wanted to mention that the pandemic is clearly exacerbating a trend that was already ongoing. There was recently an, an article uh, by Eve Ensler in The Guardian, which says uh, the pandemic, what was the title? Um, uh, disaster patriarchy, i.e. patriarchy is being reinforced by the pandemic. Now, that it, it, the pandemic is exacerbating this, definitely, but the trend was already ongoing. The, the trend, this neoconservative trend, um, and, and the desire to reverse the gains made in terms of women's rights, LGBT rights, sexual diversity, gender diversity, um, is, is only now, it seems to me, violently coming to the fore in the tremendous rise in intimate partner violence and domestic violence that we see, you know, including the sexual abuse of, of girls in households and possibly boys, that's likely then as well. Um, and while international organizations, feminist activists, researchers, we're all NGOs globally, particularly and locally, working really hard to campaign for more and better services and innovative responses to domestic violence, there really is very little political engagement with this rise in patriarchal oppression. And that is true for neoconservative governments, 
but it's also quite true for more social democratic countries in Western Europe, considering the level of violence um, um, and injustice, uh, th there's, there's very little um, um, uh, political um, scandal, really, too little political scandal about what is going on. It's, it's, the pandemic seems to be creating more space for neoconservative governance through sexual morality, a way of bringing in poorer and racialized populations into subaltern citizenship that re-emphasizes the idea of every patriarch its own fiefdom, reproducing inequality at its very, very basis in people's uh, intimate lives. I'll leave it at that and look forward to your questions. Thank you.